Hello everyone. My name is Christine Brenza and I'm the senior curator and James and Louise Glasser curator of Art of the American West at the Tucson Museum of Art. Welcome to Cookies with Curator. Today I have the privilege of talking to you with John Fawcett, an artist who is in the TMA collection. Hi John, how are you today? Great, how are you Christine? I'm great, I'm great. Yeah, so we I think are going to have a wonderful conversation today talking about your career, your work, and just whatever comes our way. How's that sound? That sounds great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let me start with um, the whole perk of this series. It's Cookies with the Curator, and we have to talk about our love of sweets, right? Exactly. So what kind of sweets do you have today? These are, uh, I didn't make these. These are my wife's Ranger cookies. And uh, it's one of my favorite cookies. She got the uh, recipe passed on from her mother, Betsy. And so Elizabeth makes these and tries to get me fat. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I, I gave you the uh, recipe. So if you want to share that with people, you can. Oh, okay. That sounds great. I am very excited about these. So what's the name Ranger cookie mean? Is there any kind of a particular meaning no, to that? I have no idea. <laughs> no. Okay. Maybe Rangers be, would use it, them on the trail. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Make something up. It's great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, um, the cookie I brought today, um, I was thinking, what would be a good one to have with John Fawcett? He's a watercolorist. He um, deals with um, cowboy art and animals. I don't know. What could we do? And so I thought about a Thin Mint. Um, I thought, well, chocolatey goodness with a little bit of coolness from the mint. Why not, right? Sure. So, you pretty much take a sugar cookie and have like the chocolate version of a sugar cookie. And then you dip it in melted chocolate with a little bit of peppermint oil in it. That's all it is. Mm. You know, everyone loves the Girl Scout cookies version. And now I realized how I can make them at home. Oh, yeah. Good for you. So we have your Ranger cookie that is a family uh, recipe, which I, I have one. Yeah, go for it. And, you know, have your coffee or your tea. Coffee. Yeah, there you go. With it's my, a good way uh, to start a conversation, isn't it? Buckenbach, Texas mug. Ooh. Oh, nice. <laughs> does, that, does that show up backwards to you or no? No, it's, it's regular. Uh, we could read it. Uh, okay. So cheers. Cheers. So John, how about we just dive in and start talking about art? Does that sound good as, as we munch Perfect. on our cookies? Yep. All right. So could you tell us a little bit about you, your background, how you got into art? Sure. Um, I never set out to be an artist. Uh, art was a hobby for me. Uh, I grew up in Iowa and had animals all my life. I got my first horse when I think I was uh, 10 years old and uh, I'd been riding since I was four or five and animals always interested me. So I went into veterinary medicine. I never thought uh, art could be a profession. Uh, I thought it was always just a hobby. But looking back at it, uh, my childhood, uh, one of my best friend's father was a professional artist, and we used to uh, go over to his house when uh, it, his dad wasn't there, and I remember vividly going up in his father's studio and just being fascinated with all the paint and paper and canvas and the smell of paint and turpentine and, and everything, and it just really intrigued me. And you don't, as a kid, you don't really think about how that type of thing affects you. Now that I look back, 
it had you know a profound effect on my psyche i think and and getting into art uh as a hobby more than anything so I, growing up i always drew and and even painted as a kid never had any professional uh art lessons or anything like that but instead of going out and playing little league softball or baseball or whatever um i'd always just draw and and mess around with art supplies and that type of thing. My parents were always very supportive of my hobby, and, which I'm very thankful for. So I ended up um, deciding when I went to college, I went to a liberal arts college and uh, decided I wanted to go into veterinary medicine. And uh, so I applied to veterinary school and I got into Iowa State uh, vet school, which is the oldest vet school in the country, and ended up uh, meeting my wife, Elizabeth, uh, in undergraduate uh, college, and uh, we ended up getting married between the, the summer between when I went graduated from college and went to vet school. So I pulled her out to Iowa. She's originally from Pennsylvania. So I pulled her to Iowa and uh, she endured the four years in veterinary school and the uh, below zero winters and wind in, in Iowa, bless her heart. The things we do for love. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was uh, offered a, a job in Pennsylvania uh, in her hometown and ended up uh, taking that job and we moved back to her hometown, which she thought that she never would do. Of course, kids are always like that, right? They never want to go back to where they grew up. But we uh, have been here for, since 1978, when I graduated. I opened my own practice uh, the next year and had that practice for about 20 years. And I was painting as a hobby there to, you know, on my days off and so forth. Um, and again, never thought art would be a profession for me. I never even thought about that. But as we were talking before, uh, my life changed in, uh, 1991, I believe when we were, uh, in Tucson, uh, and spent Thanksgiving with my wife's sister and her husband and family. Uh, they've lived in Tucson since the late mid to late 70s. And they took us to the MO Club Art Show, Mountain Oyster Club Art Show. Yes. And at that time, uh, I was just enthralled. I, I had never seen uh, contemporary Western art uh, like this displayed. I was familiar with Remington and Russell and the... Uh, deceased Western artists, but I never knew there was this whole field of Western art uh, in the contemporary world, art world. So I was enthralled by this and ended up uh, after talking with my wife, well, I should try to apply to this show, which was a juried show. So the next year I was still practicing and and applied to the show. And I remember distinctly going to the mailbox that day, coming home for lunch at my practice and getting an acceptance letter from the Mountain Oyster Club Art Show. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is wonderful. So I worked really hard and uh, had uh, one or two pieces for the show. And we went out to the show the next year and I believe that was 90, uh, 92 maybe. And um, so uh, I, there I saw my piece on the wall and I thought, this is pretty cool. You have to remember, I was still practicing veterinary medicine at the time. And here I had a chance to be around other Western artists and meet them and so forth. So uh, this was a pretty cool thing for me. I was really excited. My wife was really excited. And uh, lo and behold, my piece sold. And I thought, is this the coolest thing or what? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I, 
I was juried into this show, my piece is on the wall, and then I sold a piece of art, the very first piece of art I'd ever sold. And then they found out that my mother bought it. Oh no. <laughs> but God bless her. Uh, she was a supporter of my art and uh, she had that uh, piece all, all the years that she uh, was alive. Anyway, um, that got me uh, some more confidence and I, I started painting more and more. And uh, again, on my days off and, and so forth, I had, uh, uh, there were five veterinarians working at my practice and so I could afford to take some time off and so forth. So I was painting on the side, nights, weekends, days off, and uh, it grew and grew and I became more and more passionate. I met more and more contemporary Western artists and they all told me, you have to do this full time if you want to improve and get better. And so um, I was able to get invited to be in a gallery in Tucson and then another gallery elsewhere and another show. And pretty soon it became, uh, I, and I started selling pieces and it was, it was becoming, well, should I, um, you know, do this full time or not? And I remember in, uh, I guess it was 1995, I was talking to my stepfather who was, had just retired from being a physician. And I said, I'm having a real hard time, you know, am I crazy to try to uh, think about doing this full time? And he said, um, when you're doing art, do you think about veterinary medicine? And I said, no. And he said, well, when you're doing surgery, do you think about art? And I said, yeah, all the time. He said, there's your answer right there. Wow. So, Such advice. You may, you may have heard that story before. But anyway, um, within about six months, I uh, ended up being uh, in January of 1996. I was able to sell my veterinary practice. I still uh, helped out a couple days a week. And um, so I thought, well, I can always go back to veterinary medicine uh, if, if I don't succeed as an artist. And I kept my license for, I think, about uh, two or three more years. And finally, I said, I'm not going to keep my veterinary license because I, I heard that Tammy Wynette kept her beautician's license for a few years until she was a successful singer. And so I figured, well, if she dropped her beautician's license, I can drop my veterinary license. So I think it was 1998 or 99, and I stopped uh, any practicing in veterinary medicine and, and have never looked back. So that's kind of how I got into it. And uh, the MO Club and the MO Club Art Show uh, was a real impetus for that. And, and we had talked before about uh, meeting uh, Mr. Goodman and Aileen, his wife, and uh, they were very influential in, in uh, my career and, and with their, uh, the whole MO Club Art Show um, thing. Yeah. So uh, that, was, uh, that was how I ended up, we talked about uh, the, the uh, piece that you have in the, in the uh, Tucson Museum of Art there. And Mr. Goodman was uh, suggested that uh, that would be a good place for my piece. So oh, okay. um, it's uh, 1996 is where I started uh, painting full time. And then more and more shows, more galleries and so forth. And uh, it just built, built from there. That's wonderful. Um, do you think that because of being a veterinarian, it enabled you to switch to being an artist. Do you think, you know, one couldn't have happened without the other? Yeah, a couple things there. Um, number one, um, it, it gave me a uh, financial uh, a business background, um, which I think 
is really important in the art world. A lot of artists are not um, good business people, uh, I would say. I wouldn't say a lot, but it, it, I would say that it just helped me with the, a, biz, a good business sense, which you need, I think, because being an artist is a business like any other business, you know. Sure. Um, the second thing is uh, it, it gave me, because of anatomy and physiology with animals, animals are a large part of my painting, and um, whether it's horses, dogs, even people, uh, a good sense of anatomy, I think it really helps out um, in, in, the, in my work. Um, and, you know, I, we still have horses um, to this day. And so being around horses uh, and that anatomical, physiological um, knowledge has helped me immensely, uh, I think. So those two things really helped out. And plus it gave me a, a, a good cushion um, financially so that, you know, if I, like I said before, if I didn't succeed as an artist, I could always go back to something else, um, you know, in the future. Sure. Now that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So you were talking about the piece in the Tucson Museum of Art collection. How about if we take a moment and look at that? So just hold on a second and I will pull that up. Okay, here we are. This is Hits or Misses, which is a watercolor. And it was given to the Tucson Museum of Art back in 2000. So is there anything that you wanna tell us about this piece? Uh, when I first started painting, uh, because I uh, was more familiar with the medium, I pretty much only painted in watercolor. Um, for the first five, six years of my professional painting career, this, of course, is a watercolor. Uh, it's from the uh, famous historic Bell Ranch in New Mexico. Uh, it's near Las Vegas, New Mexico. And I was invited there by a friend of mine. Uh, his name was Jeff Lane. And his family, uh, at the time, owned the Bell Ranch. And... Uh, this is a 292,000 acre ranch, and it was very famous. Uh, the Stetson hat box, cowboy hat box, um, has black and white photographs of the Bell Ranch on the side of it. And many artists have painted there, and I was excited to be able to go there. Uh, Robert Lockheed probably was one of the most famous artists that um, painted there quite often. And, um, you know, there, there are many, many examples of uh, Mr. Lockheed's work uh, from the Bell Ranch. In fact, we have, were able to uh, purchase a few drawings and uh, watercolors of his from the Bell Ranch, which we were excited about. But anyway, this is a, a cowboy named Paul. Uh, he was uh, a cowboy at the Bell Ranch. They had many, many, uh, there was a, uh, a couple books written about the Bell Ranch. And I spent time there in gatherings and roundups and was able to ride there and camp there and it was just a wonderful experience and so uh, this is a, a, a from one of the gatherings at the time brandings and uh, so uh, as i said the watercolor was the medium i painted in for the first several years of my career and then i switched to oils and i've done uh, several paintings of the Bell Ranch or from scenes from the Bell Ranch, but um, I think this was a kind of an example of one of my earlier watercolors that um, I thought would fit in well um, at the Tucson Museum of Art 
uh, in the uh, genre of, you know, cowboy art. Yes, it absolutely does. So watercolor takes a lot of skill. I, I find that very impressive that as someone who was just breaking out as being a full-time artist, that this was your medium. Um, what is it about watercolor that you enjoy? The reason I started out in watercolor is I just didn't really know much about oil or oil paints and uh, canvases and, and that type of thing. But I was familiar with watercolors as um, many kids have watercolors growing up. And um, so we uh, in our household had art supplies of watercolors. And I guess I was just more familiar with watercolor. Um, but the whole thinking of of painting in watercolor, it's kind of a backwards process because you have to oftentimes lay in washes or backgrounds first and get more detailed as you uh, bring the painting to uh, a close or a finish. Uh, a lot of people do the opposite. They start off in oil paints um, because in oils or acrylics, you can cover up mistakes uh, if you have them um, because the paint is so opaque. You can't do that very easily with watercolors. Um, now, a lot of my watercolors have fairly heavy pigment on them so that uh, dark pigments especially uh, can be um, you know, applied over initial pigments if you make a mistake, but it's, it's pretty hard. I think that really has helped me because uh, if you try to get things anatomically right, let's say uh, with a watercolor, then I find it easier as you move into the oil medium because you can refine things uh, if, if something doesn't look quite right as far as anatomy on a horse or a person or something. The thing I like about, a lot of people ask me, what do you like to paint in best, what medium, watercolor or oil? And I really don't have a favorite. Um, I will do many watercolors. If I have my watercolor supplies out at one time, I may do several watercolors in a row and then put that away and then get my oils out and do several oils in a row. But <clears throat> each medium has their own uh, characteristics that I enjoy. In watercolors, um, I like the fluidity and they call them happy accidents. Um, hopefully they're happy. Um, <laughs> there's a, 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 just a spontaneous uh, blending of color and pigment uh, that you can't um, try to do. Uh, it, it actually, sometimes I rotate the board and uh, so forth so that it can, the colors can mix uh, easily, but um, there's, there's no real distinct way to um, uh, duplicate that with an oil. Oil, when you put pigment down, that's basically where that pigment stays. Uh, unless you're using a, a very fluid medium, let's say. But with watercolors, it's, it's uh, by guess and by gosh, I guess, and, and, and you can uh, use that to your advantage if you want to have this loose, fluid feel. For example, here in the background where there's a lot of dust and, and so forth, and some of the cattle um, are not quite as refined as as you come forward with the cowboy and the horse. So I try to use that to my advantage. Oh, okay. Oh, Where I think in, in oils, um, the advantage in oils is there's a richness of color. There's the impasto feeling of uh, pigment. Uh, the thickness of the pigment, which of course you can't duplicate in watercolor. 
So each medium has their own kind of uh, characteristics that I try to take advantage of. Okay. Well, I I do see here now that you've explained it the to the the qualities of the watercolor, and you do have a lot of richness and color. For example, the blue jeans there. Um, yeah. Thank you for explaining that. I appreciate an artist walking us through their work. And there's some, there's some, and you, I, I've done many, uh, taught many painting workshops, mainly on um, painting horses and horse anatomy, just because of my veterinary background. But um, a lot of students ask me, well, how do you know what color to mix with what, or what colors do you use on your palette? And I pretty much tell everybody, you, you need to um, try, uh, try this out for yourself. Try a certain palette out. I can give you the colors I use in my watercolor palette or the colors I use in my oil palette. But every artist is different. Every artist has their own um, favorite colors on their palette and so forth. And you really, um, you have to just uh, spend hours and hours of painting and try to figure out what works for you. And that will, uh, after hundreds and hundreds, or uh, they say the 10,000 hours of painting, that will tell you more than anything. Um, as far as, because there are certain colors, especially in watercolor, there are certain colors that you can mix and they go well together or they don't mix well. Um, and you just find that out. Uh, somebody can show you, but, but you just pretty much have to uh, learn that on your own. It's a lot of experimentation and practice. Experimentation, yeah. The 10,000 hours. Oh, I believe it. I'd believe it. So um, I noticed that it this piece is a gift of you and your wife to the collection. Right. Is there any story behind that? No, we just wanted to, um, I think, give back to um, the art world and show our appreciation for um, especially what Tucson uh, did for us because if we hadn't probably made that trip to Tucson uh, in the early 90s, I might still be practicing veterinary medicine. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, we wanted to give back. That's why I've tried to do some uh, workshops too, to try to help younger artists starting out um, where I was. We all start out at some point, whether you go to art school or not. Um, you have to start somewhere. And so I wanted to try to give back to younger artists. And in this case with the uh, TMA, I wanted to give back to uh, them for what they did for our journey, our, our uh, art journey. Yeah, I like that, an art journey. And you're still on it. Still on the journey, yep. You never quite reach the end, hopefully. Right. So We're always learning. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of um, being on your journey, can you tell us a little bit like about your creative process? Do you use photography, sketches? What, what do you do when you start to create a work? Yeah, both watercolor and oil are different, of course, uh, in my creative process. Uh, in watercolor, uh, what I do is I, I take uh, paper and I have, uh, I usually use um, some specially made paper uh, from, that's manufactured uh, at a place called Twin Rocker uh, in Indiana. And I found this paper uh, that I really like and it's textured. Um, I take the paper and I get it wet either in the shower or a hose outside. And then I go ahead and take a board and I staple it to a board and set it in the sunlight. 
And by doing that, it makes the waviness of the paper go away and it dries perfectly flat. So once I have that completely dry and stapled and it's perfectly flat, then I go ahead and do a, a pencil drawing for my composition. And I work uh, from photographs most of the time. And I have thousands of photographs on my uh, computer um, categorized from um, skies and clouds to dogs to horses to roundups to I do a lot of Native American work uh, and so I have Native American models that I photograph and in certain scenes and in certain scenarios. So once I get an idea, I can, a lot of people ask me, well, how do you know whether you're going to do a watercolor or an oil? And I can almost look at a, a photograph or a, even a scene outside if I'm painting on plein air and decide, well, this would be a great watercolor or this, this has to be an oil. It's just something that I can visualize in my mind. And again, it, it, it has a lot in to your do mind. with um, if it's a fluid piece, uh, if you want a lot of blending of color and or dust or that type of thing, like in the previous piece that we looked at. So again, getting back to my watercolor, once I draw uh, this piece in with pencil, then I work from back to front laying in washes in the background and getting more detailed going forward to the finest detail. Uh, those are the last pigments that I put down on, on the piece. With my oils, uh, it's a little bit different. I do uh, what they call a grisaille study. And uh, I take, I usually work with linen uh, on either board or uh, gator foam, which is a very lightweight, non-warping material that uh, they glue linen to. And once I have this, I like a hard surface. Some people like stretched canvas that gives a little bit on, you know, putting your paint down. Because I think I started out in watercolor, I was used to resting my hand on the board drawing or painting. So if you do that with a canvas too much, you'll have this denting of the canvas or linen. So I prefer to work with a harder surface uh, of my linen. So once I, again, I work from photographs and I go ahead and draw in the composition, whether it's a horse piece or a Native American piece, whatever. And uh, then I spray fixative on my pencil or charcoal so it doesn't run because when you put turpentine on a pencil that's or charcoal that's unfixed, you've lost it all. Yeah. You don't want to do that. So I spray fixative on it. Once that's dry, takes 15 minutes. Then I'll go ahead and start laying in a burnt sienna, what I call a block in. And the block in does several things. It gives me my composition, it gives me my lightest lights and my darkest darks. And if something is wrong with the composition, I want to add something or subtract something. It's a much easier process to do that with turpentine. You can just scrub it out and and change it at that stage rather than putting layers of paint on and getting the whole painting near completion. And then you say, well, this horse's leg is a little bit too short, or I want to add an extra cow in the piece or something like that. So this block in uh, needs to dry then, and it's a burnt sienna. It's almost looking at a black and, uh, like looking at a black and white photograph. So once the block in is done, and that dries and depending on where where you are uh, may take several days or a week to dry and i have several block-ins usually around my studio 
And um, when, when the blockings are completed and completely dry, then I can go ahead and start working on a piece. And I usually work on one watercolor at a time, or if I'm working on oils, I work on one oil at a time, mostly, um, unless I have something that really needs to dry and I wanna put some finishing touches on it at a later date. But I might have several of these block ins in my studio at one time. And the again, the advantage of using a block in is composition, lightest lights, darkest darks, and you can see if if all your anatomy is is correct at that stage. Um, if you'd like, I'm in my studio now in Pennsylvania, and um, I can go ahead and show you something yes. I'm working on right now on my easel. Oh, okay. Um, not sure whether you can see that okay or not, but this is a, of course, a Native American piece, and I have gone ahead and this is just a block in I'm starting to do. You can see um, I'm getting fairly near the end of the block in process. You can see that there's still some white linen there that I haven't done. Um, I don't get real detailed with background or foreground. Um, I pretty much want to show, again, the composition and the anatomy and everything at that stage. So I'm not sure whether you can see this, but yeah, I, I have, you know, some fairly detailed renderings of, of course, the horse and, and the Native American here. But um, I have a couple other block ins here, pieces. Yes. We'd love to see it. There's a, a smaller Native American piece that's blocked in. I did this a few days ago and it's drying. Again, another block in. And so I start laying in color over these and then it ends up being a finished piece. Like that, yes. Like that. Or like that. Wow, what a difference when you add the color. Yeah, but again, you can still see from a block in what, uh, excuse me for walking around here, but you still can see from a block in, you know, well, is something, do I wanna add something or, you know, does this horse anatomically look okay or whatever? Again, it's much easier to change at this stage than going on and doing the whole finished piece and saying, well, I messed something up, I, I need to start over. So right. that just gives you a little bit of an idea of my creative process for both watercolors and oils. No, thank you for showing us. It, it gives us an idea of the groundwork that you have to do as an artist, that you can't just start throwing color on there and having it be a completed painting. There has to be layers, really, um, right. to build the, the reason painting. that I, I guess I should explain a little bit. The grisaille um, is a, uh, I didn't invent that. It's been going on for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. The old masters used to use this type of, you know, painting process. And not everybody does it, um, but it helps me. And the um, warm color, the burnt sienna color that I use as an underpainting um, actually shows through um, into the final painting uh, somewhat. Sometimes uh, there will be spots where there's very little pigment um, and that warmth shows through, but uh, you, you know, you could use uh, 
purple as an underpainting and you could get the same effect as a uh, with the underpainting for anatomy and composition but that coolness of the purple or blue would show through and it doesn't have the same effect as the warm color and the uh, people are drawn to warmth uh, and so a purple underpainting just would not you know cut it so that makes that's sense. why we use that warrant it doesn't have to be burnt sienna but that's what i use but it, it could be some other type of of warm color in your color spectrum okay okay thanks for clarifying that so can you tell us i don't know maybe a little little bit of what projects you're working on you don't have to share secrets but do you have ideas you're working on pieces that are coming shows that are coming up anything like that yeah the um the show that i'm working on right now is um the well first of all the the next two shows that i, I am in are in tucson um the mountain oyster club show which is in a few weeks in november and um which i have three pieces uh in uh the show and also the settlers west gallery uh in tucson if i can mention them absolutely and, uh, they uh i have three pieces uh in that show uh watercolor and two oils um and that show is uh next weekend so it's always the weekend uh before thanksgiving like the opening of the mo show of course this year with covid everything's a little different and there will be no uh you know opening where we normally travel out to tucson to these shows we won't be traveling this year Unfortunately, it's always a highlight of our year to come to Tucson to see relatives and to uh, be able to go to the shows and see friends and see clients and patrons and so forth. Uh, we always love doing that. But this year, you know, it's a little bit different, obviously. Uh, so those are pieces that are actually uh, in Tucson right now. And then the, uh, the sh next show that I'm working on is the Masters of the American West show, which is at the Autry Museum, which is in LA in February. It's the uh, February 27th, I believe this year. And um, I'm not sure whether we'll be traveling to that show or not, but I have um, several, usually have four pieces in that show museum show and that's a uh, draw show where people sign up for paintings if they want to put their name in a box uh, and then names are drawn out so uh, I'm working on um, paintings for that show um, almost completed um, I try to for most of these shows because I work in both watercolor and oil mediums I try to have a variety. Uh, again, I try not to all have have all uh, oils or all watercolors in a show. I just like to to have a variety for my collectors. So, and I also like to have a variety of subject matter. Um, so, I may have uh, some Native American pieces. I may have some cowboy pieces. Um, most of the time, I don't do just landscapes although I do uh, like to paint outside, plein air, uh, just for, uh, to help me with my backgrounds and so forth for my other work. But uh, I'm not known for that, so uh, I, I like to try to tell a story with my pieces. I guess that's kind of the main thing that I want to get across with my art is some type of story, whether it be, you know, a relationship with an animal. Um, that's really important in my life and my wife's life uh, is our relationships with our animals. So I try to convey some type of relationship with an animal or, uh, 
you know, some type of story with Native Americans, a certain ceremony or um, a certain hunting scene or that type of thing. So um, storytelling for me is, is very important. Um, we spend time, I guess I should say, in both Pennsylvania, where I am right now in my studio, um, and we spend time in Colorado where we have a ranch uh, in the mountains near Steamboat Springs. So we spend about six months in each place. And when we're in Pennsylvania, um, we're fairly close to the uh, Chad's Ford area where Andrew Wyeth and Jamie Wyeth and N.C. Wyeth uh, and the whole Wyeth family uh, painted. And that has a uh, real important meaning in my life. Um, I was able to meet Andrew Wyeth uh, when he was alive. And um, I, I've met uh, Jamie Wyeth and Nikki Wyeth, his brother. Um, and they've had a, quite an influence on my life, both because of, uh, especially Andrew Wyeth being a watercolor artist uh, and Jamie as well. Um, and also uh, quite a storyteller uh, with his work, with his paintings. And uh, I'm involved with the Brandywine Museum there. Uh, I'm on a museum committee there. And, and so um, have met a number of people that have had a big influence on my life uh, working at the museum uh, and getting kind of the inside story there. So that's really been a, a, a very uh, influential thing in my life to in my art journey. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a, a thing I've been very fortunate to uh, be part of. That's wonderful. And just by coincidence, you know, I didn't, I didn't tell you to say anything about the Wyeths ahead of time, but we are having a show opening in January. Um, it's a Bank of America show called um, Three Generations, um, The Wyatts. And so it features those artists' work along with um, Victoria, um, the granddaughter. She will be mm -hmm. um, working with us. And um, we have Peter Hurd in the exhibition and um, Henriette. So we're very excited about that. Oh, it'll be great. Yeah, and Victoria is a very, uh, I'm sure you've had contact with her, and uh, she's a um, very gregarious, vivacious person that uh, um, tells great anecdotal stories about um, her grandfather and uh, her uncle Jamie, too. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Quite a tie-in, you know, from Art of the American West to the Wyeths, you know, it, it all comes together. You know? Right, and, and of course, uh, N.C. Wyeth, uh, uh, Andrew's father and Jamie's grandfather, uh, spent uh, time in the West. Um, he was a student of Howard Pyle, and that's how, uh, uh, from Wilmington, Delaware, and that's how he got to Chad's Ford, is uh, Howard Pyle would take his students to Chad's Ford in the summertime uh, to paint, kind of in the country from the big city of Wilmington. And it's about 10 miles away. And uh, N.C. Wyeth ended up loving Chad's Ford because it reminded him of Needham, Massachusetts, where he was from. And he was very homesick uh, when he was a young man, a young artist in in Delaware, and Chad's Ford really, uh, Pennsylvania, really reminded him of Massachusetts. So when he got his first commission uh, uh, for illustration for Treasure Island, he took some of the funds and bought, uh, I think it was 18 acres of land there in Chad's Ford, where he ended up building a house and a studio where you can visit today, tour his home, tour his studio. And now they have uh, Andrew's studio 
uh, open to uh, for for visitors uh, from the spring of the year through the fall. And it's fascinating to um, see the studios and, and where they worked and actually stand there where both Andrew and Jamie completed, NNC completed some of these great works of art. Yeah, I bet it's a wonderful experience. Yeah. It is, yeah. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground today, don't you? <laughs> yes. I could keep talking and talking forever about art. <laughs> and, I, and I can keep listening. You know? But um, I guess... I want to bore your viewers. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we better wrap it up today, huh? But uh, it's really been a pleasure talking with you, hearing about how you became an artist and how you really put your work together, this creative process you have between two media and really your inspirations based on, you know, your time in Pennsylvania, your time out West, you know, you, it cum culminates all together. So I really appreciate hearing about that. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to do what I do. And uh, I'm, as they say, I'm living the dream. Yeah. Hey, you can't beat that. Right. All right. Well, I guess we'll sign off. This is Christine Brinza here with John Fawcett um, from the Tucson Museum of Art. And we'll be seeing you next time. Bye. Yeah.